So, so actually, that brings in an interesting point. Like, what what's the delimitation between your business life and your personal life? And and can or from your experience, are people using different calendars? Like, how like what? what How's that work out? Yeah, it's a it's I think one of the interesting challenges of our time in general is that the line between work and home has in many cases for the knowledge worker evaporated. Yeah. But you know, I think more to the better, right? I think that that is actually a good thing that I am in some ways more in control than ever between what I'm doing at any given time. And if I need to get work done at a particular time, that's great. If I need to um, you know, be with my family, that's great. Um, you know, I, I routinely, and I, I know I'm fortunate in this way in, in the IBM culture, but if I want to go spend an hour in my daughter's classroom, you know, in her third grade class during the work day, that, that's fine, right? Because I'm going to be on calls with China and India and Japan at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. My iPad or my Blackberry has everything I need, work or business, or work or personal, sorry, uh, all in one place. Um, so for me, I maintain one calendar. I have an overlay of that. That's my eight-year-old's calendar, though, right? So, you know, I, but I'm managing a calendar for an eight-year-old. But uh, moms and dads everywhere have always done that. It's been on the kitchen refrigerator. And instead, now it's on, you know, Google or Yahoo or some service like that. It's electronic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But that, but that marriage is incredibly powerful, and I think it's important. Um, you know, whether, whether what it allows is uh, things like my wife now. I don't have to send her my travel itineraries anymore. They're on TripIt, right? so I just made her a reader of all my stuff on TripIt. She knows what hotels I'm in, what flights I'm on. There's no questions anymore. I don't make mistakes anymore. Oh no, that's not the flight I'm on. I typed a number wrong. Whatever. It's all. It's all there in electronic form. So yeah, is that my work life? Is that my personal life? It's what I do. Like yeah, I, and, and, and if you look at you know, your role specifically in, in IBM, um, you know IBM is known to be one of the leaders when it comes to the larger enterprises and so on. And so, what are the privacy concerns of exactly what you talked about? Like the the balancing the private life, corporate life. Mm -hmm. People are meeting in one calendar. They want to share it outside their enterprise. Yep. What are what are companies saying about this? Yeah, and there's still a lot of companies that we sell to that you know you put up a, a screenshot of a, a user's profile on Tungle and they go, oh wait a second, that's got all my stuff on it, right? I had that reaction when I did a demo of Tungle at one of our, our conferences in May, and so I've started doing my demos now, logged out of Tungle, and I, I eventually log in, right? But um, so there's still a lot of companies that are real paranoid about where is this data going. Um, especially remote devices, Blackberries and iPhones and that. And it's an interesting issue because if I am in a company that, you know, decides one day I don't need, you know, I'm not needed anymore and they go do a remote wipe, my personal data is probably on that device too and I just, I had no shot to get to it, right? So there's all sorts of interesting implications of who owns my data. In email, I get that, right? In email, yeah, okay, fine. I left the company, you want your email back, no problem. But the calendar, the calendar is kind of like me, right? That's in, me as an individual. So there's definitely some issues that haven't really been worked through yet, and that people are going to struggle with. And how do you think it's going to evolve? I think that um, I think having aggregation points, I think having redundant data. I mean, you know, it's great they can wipe my BlackBerry, but it's it's on Tumble right now. So I know that I've got a copy there. I just hope that nobody goes and sinks and overwrites it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, I think redundant data, I think overlays, you know, publishing through CalDAV and things like that, some of which we have to catch up on, admittedly, you know, give people some ability to own their own data around their own self and overlay that and marry it with their professional environment. Um, but I think that line's very, very blurry, and I don't ex expect we're going to move to any point of clarity. I think the nat nature of work has changed so much that trying to keep your work life and your personal life completely separate and secure from each other in 2015. We won't even think about that concept. Interesting. And so if you look at, um, you know, back when it was client server, you've had, you know, your company had your, your data on their server and, and, then, and then it started to migrate towards the web, yep. right? What were some of the privacy concerns back when it started? Actually, you, there's still now, It's still right? there, yeah. Yeah, but, but okay, so, so 
what were the challenges? And some of them have already been brought down. Like if you look at Salesforce, I think you know Salesforce has done a good job in educating people that the cloud is is, is safe. Right? Yeah, I mean we're we're at a point where not everybody's bought in, right? We did a survey with um, one of our resellers. Six hundred people filled it out in the last few weeks. More than half the participants in the survey said we'll never do anything in the cloud. You know, yeah, it's twenty ten. Right? So are those banks, are those government agencies, are those insurance companies, are they manufacturing? You know, I, don't, I haven't gone and looked at that data yet. But half of them just said no, no cloud, period. But the other half were like, oh yeah, cloud's an inflection point, great opportunity for us, we want to do more. And it's the pervasive access, it's the fixed cost of operation, I mean, there's all, the, all those benefits. So I think there are still many, many issues that companies need to get their heads around of, okay, my data's going to live somewhere else, and that's okay. But what data is it that's going to be okay if it lives out there? Um, we look at in in the email world in the archiving space, right? There is the traditional on-premise, you know, heavy-duty IBM Common Store kind of content management stuff that is really secure and really well managed. And then there's in the cloud archiving providers like Asonian, who are just treating it like any other data feed that's going to go live on an Amazon server and with the right passwords and other authentication, you're going to get to it. So it's a risk factor thing, and a lot of companies that are you know, risk adverse are not going to go there. A lot of companies that say the trade-offs are worth it, like many uh, decisions about sort of Web 2.0 in general right now, are going to say, this is okay for us, we know the risks, you know, the user's in control, or we as, as an entity are still in control enough that this is okay. But you still find plenty of people that in 2010 aren't ready to be on Facebook, aren't ready to be on LinkedIn, aren't ready to be on Twitter. Those are the kind of people that probably are still not ready to have their corporate data living out in the cloud. On the other hand, there is Salesforce, there is Google Apps, there is Lotus Live, um, you know, and companies are hungry for that kind of you know, SaaS business model and are willing to accept the risk to get the benefit of predictable service, always upgrading, uh, fixed cost and you know sort of all the other benefits. Mm. So I think privacy is a concern, but I think there's a lot of other yeah. pieces to the mix. You know, um, um, I don't know if it's actually a conversation <laughs> from the, the manifesto, but it's actually just a question that <laughs> yeah. I have okay. as well. So um, if we want to have that conversation offline, is you know like if you look at the price point, right? The price point for uh, Lotus Lotus Live Notes, for example, five dollars per user per month. Yep. It's, it's fairly cheap yep. for what people used to pay 500 bucks for our perpetual license, right? Which also means that for a company like IBM, the or for Lotus, the the revenues will eventually see a price squeeze, maybe. And that's my point. Like my my question or my point is, what? How will you be able to maintain as a corporation the level of revenue and profit that you were? going after, and maybe it's a, not a conversation for this, but whatever. <laughs> but that's like actually a question I wanted yeah. to pick your brain on. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I can give, I'll tell you what Microsoft says. Yeah. Now you can put on camera. <laughs> <laughs> Microsoft says that BPOS is a play for bigger share of wallet. That they actually think they're going to generate more revenue than they do off of license sales because they have now a fixed annuity coming in every month for every user, whether they were on software assurance or not. And that the more services they add in the cloud, the more revenue they'll generate per user. I look at the cloud more as a choice of delivery model. So for me, I'm not, I'm not looking at it as a revenue maximization scheme, but once the customer has bought a perpetual license for notes, the annuity revenue is 26%, right? Pretty industry standard kind of a thing. Um, what they'll pay us for Lotus Live is probably about the same as what they were paying in, in annuity revenue. Uh, so it does come down to the same kind of attitude as Microsoft's is, if I add to Lotus Live e-meetings and collaboration and file sharing and you know a number of other services, the revenue to IBM will, will certainly same. increase over time. Okay. Um, the profitability part's harder, but if you look at SaaS companies, and this is probably why you're asking, you have to look at cost as being an area where you're constantly optimizing, right? So, you know, what can we do to get 10 cents a user a month operational cost out this month? What are we going to do to knock another 15 cents out? And when we look at companies in the SaaS space, the ones that are doing well financially have not just figured out a revenue equation, they've figured out a, a cost equation. 
And in software, I never really had to think about that. <laughs> right? I had a set of fixed costs to build a version of the product, and that was it. My variable cost was zero, basically zero. Yeah. Now I have variable cost. Interesting. Huh. OK. So uh, in, in your mind, I mean, you briefly talked about you know, the, this, these are the things that Project Vulcan is working on. But in your mind, what is the calendar of the future? So I think the calendar of the future has to, in some ways, disappear into the background. I don't know how and when that happens, but it has to no longer be a, now I go to my calendar and think about calendaring. I have to really get to a place where it is seamlessly woven into the other tasks that I'm doing, what the analysts love to call contextual collaboration. The calendar hasn't quite succumbed to contextual collaboration yet. Part of it is the PDA or mobile device mentality of, okay, let me just check my calendar. Do I have that time available? But, you know, in, a, in an iPad or, you know, that kind of device configuration, it's, I have to stop what I'm doing, click the big button, go over to my calendar, get to the day that I'm looking. There's like 17 steps to go be productive in the calendar. Whereas it should be, I'm looking at a document and now I need to know if on July 18th I can do something with that document. Um, so our thinking in Project Vulcan and lots of other people's thinking in you know, some of the projects we see right now is how do you get away from that task orientation and much more to a process orientation or a contextual orientation. Um, I don't know, I've worked with calendaring for, what did we say, 15, 16 years and it hasn't happened yet. Um, I think there will still, because of the nature of the calendar driving my, my activity, still be a discrete activity, but it should get more integrated into other things. And then I think the other question that really has to be answered is how much sharing do I end up doing? I think in most companies still, people don't make their calendar wide open, they don't let people see what they're working on, and there has to be a way to make that socially acceptable in the company, just like it has been to share my documents and share my knowledge. Right, because I mean, we've gone down this curve in, in collaboration in general. When we started shipping notes 20 years ago, we had to teach companies why it would be good to share the information that everybody had in the company. Most companies were, my knowledge is my value to the company. And so our first notes customers actually had to put incentive programs in place for humans to get compensated for putting stuff into notes databases. It's kind of the same with calendars. I still don't really feel comfortable telling people what am I spending my time on every day. My own staff, though, probably could really benefit from seeing which customers I'm meeting or what projects I'm spent choosing to spend my time on, what are my priorities, more than at a once a month staff meeting or whatever. So there's still a cultural barrier, and I see that in lots of our customers, and I think it just stems from the personal nature of calendaring. And that's probably the last piece that I would say kind of in the future we still have to address as an industry. I get, as a vendor, more feature requests for calendar than any other part of our messaging collaboration because calendaring is an intensely personal activity. How I want to operate is different than how the next person wants to operate. And it's different in Japan, and it's different in Israel, and it's different in Germany, and you know, we build a horizontal product. right? So, you know, we almost shipped Notes version 8 without the ability to see the week number in the Notes 8 calendar. And at the last minute, I basically stopped the ship because we hadn't put that feature in and we had planned to put it in later. I said, you can't ship a calendar without week number support for the German market because they drive events around, well, in week 17, we're going to do X. Or in Japan, they really want to view calendars horizontally and not vertically because of the cultural hierarchy within the, the country or in you know Hebrew it's got to really go right to left and the work day has to the work week has to start on Sunday not on Monday and you know so the feature requests are constant because there are cultural differences around the world and every individual has a feeling of how they want to do it and then the other impact is every new device that comes out has a different way of calendaring and so people want to borrow the best and worst. For me right now, my big inflection point is, as I keep looking at it, my iPad sitting over there, great calendar system. Apple, as always, has done a really great job on usability. But guess what? There's no free time search. There's no ability to counter propose. There's no ability to delegate a meeting to somebody else. I can't even send comments in if I accept a meeting. There's, there's nothing. It's yes, no, maybe. 
So really great interface, but because they've narrowed the scope so much of what they're going to actually try to accomplish. Well, of course, if I was building